how, how does that help? Right. So I'm going to be like, so it was this kind of moment of like a little bit of fear. Like I'm going to go back into the job workplace and be like, yeah, I worked for my family, dropped out of college, joined the Marine Corps and did that for nine years and have, I'm um, starting over. Right. Yeah. At almost 30. And I was like, oh crap. Like, and I, I had enough confidence to believe that I could get out and go do something else. And it, and I felt like it was time for myself to do that, to be happy and family. I didn't want to just stay because of the financial security, but I was at, I was also like emotionally prodded into action. Like you've got to learn something and figure out and become competent at something else because you're going to walk away from this. I think one of the things we have to fight in life is, is the concept that we, we always need more. It's, it's always just a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, and, and that can be healthy because drive you to success and you can reach goals you didn't think were possible 10 years ago. But, uh, the most finite resource in this world is not money, it's time. And so when you're always going a little bit more, you're, there's something else that you could be doing with your time, right? I don't allow, I allow money to be a tool that I use, but it doesn't begin to possess me. That's my goal. Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, the show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires of Ville podcast. This is episode number 374. This is the podcast where everyday millionaires come dish out the deets about their investments, wealth building secrets, and of course, their blunders. We are your hosts, Jason Stacy, as we dive into the completely unscripted world of millionaires who could be your next door neighbor. Our guests will reveal how they turned their piggy banks into treasure chests, share investment strategies that might just make you look at your 401k with renewed hope, and tell personal stories that just might tug the heartstrings. So plug in and prepare to find out how regular folks like you and me turn their dreams into dollar signs. And don't worry, while we're here to get the goods, we've only edited to keep things family friendly. It is the fall season, that is for sure. Today on the show, we've got Josh. He's got a net worth of just over a million bucks. And most of it is in his tax-advantaged accounts. Does have a little bit in some other accounts as well, and then a little bit in some real estate. And he has quite a remarkable journey being in the military, going into finance uh, as a career, uh, kind of later in his in his in his journey, and led him to to kind of becoming a millionaire. And he is our first guest from the great state of Alaska, which I've not been to yet, but it's been on my bucket list. One of the few states that I haven't been to yet. So I've got to make a, got to make a trip up there one of these times. Uh, but we get into kind of the, the cost of living situation there and how some of that has, has enabled him uh, to do the things that he's been able to do. So going to be a great episode with him. As always, we're looking for a great guest to come on the show. If you're interested, send us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. And if you happen to be worth 400 or more and want to be partic- participate on episode 400, which is coming up here pretty quickly, uh, send us an email. We'd love to have you. And with that... Let's get right into the episode with Josh. Josh, do you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Josh Church. Um, I uh, grew up uh, all around the world, really. I was born in Alaska, which is where we're interviewing this from. But uh, my dad moved us to Bend, Oregon when we were kids. Then we bounced over to the Philippines and lived over there for about four years before we came back to Alaska. I was here for a few years, and then I decided I was going to join the Marine Corps. So that bounced me around to four different continents and different things for nine years. And then I came back to Fairbanks, Alaska. Through the course of that, I've had different jobs, you know, started construction work in the family. That's kind of what my brother did, what my family has grown up running construction companies. And uh, obviously the Marine Corps was a whole different thing. Came back, uh, went back into construction, went back to school, got a college degree and decided I wanted to do something different. And so for the last almost four years, I've been in finance now, um, which is kind of tied into this story. Um, I never thought I wanted to work in finance, but I started to want to achieve financial freedom. And then I 
started enjoying some of this stuff and it led it to be what I thought was just going to be working for my own improvement ended up actually being a hobby and then it became a career. Wow. Awesome. Uh, kind of crazy journey that you've been on for a little while here and, and lived all over the place. I, I got to ask, I mean, we're in the middle of summer here or whatever. Are, are you, are you basically on 24 hours of daylight now in Fairbanks? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I was, well, I don't know where we're at, what we're at with officially, but it, it's light, you know, you, you can, I think that the 24 hour daylight, uh, the peak of that is is still to come uh, in a month or something, the summer solstice. Uh, but, you know, you wake up, it's light, you go to bed, it's light, which is the total opposite of the winter. You know, I mean, in the winter time, you know, you, it might be you drive to work at, uh, in the morning and it's dark and then you, you drive home and it's, it's dark. You know, so it's, uh, you might have light from uh, 10 to, to 2 o'clock or 10 to 4 or something. Um, you're pretty much e- always either gaining about seven minutes or losing seven minutes a day. Um, but yeah, right now it, you could be outside at 10, 11 o'clock and, uh, maybe even later, I don't know. Um, and it's uh, super, super light outside. So it's really easy. Like the kids, I've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old and we normally tried to keep them, have their bedtimes at seven and eight, uh, at night, but you'll look down at your watch and it'll be like nine o'clock. You're like, Oh crap, I got to take the kids to bed. Cause they're out running <laughs> around in the yard, you know, and it just feels like, uh, like three o'clock in the afternoon, you know? So it's real easy to blow past the bedtime this time of year. Oh my goodness. I, I can't imagine. I've always wanted to have one of those midnight tea times, but, uh, we're getting close. I think summer solstice yeah. should be like in a few days here, but Come on uh, up here. yeah, I got to do one of these days it's on the bucket list. I think I've got maybe next year. Or the year after, I can't remember. We've got an Alaskan cruise planned, oh, that'd so be fun. Yeah. I'll yeah. I'll try to get it then. So, what's your net worth today? So today, according to this Money Guy planner, it's uh, like a thousand. Oh, it just logged me out. A thousand fifty. Uh, I mean, one million fifty. You know, uh, ish, right around there. So, so I'd newly, say, newly minted yeah, millionaire new. then. Pretty nice. new, yeah, yeah. Congrats uh, on that pretty excited of kind of breaking that mark, you know, cause I've been working towards that for quite a few years. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited just kind of over it. I mean, you know, and I'm not nickel and diming, like counting the trucks and stuff, but if you're, you're counting, uh, uh, investable assets pretty much. Um, but yeah, just kind of breaking, breaking that mark, uh, this year really, uh, which is exciting. Nice. I, Congrats. That's awesome. So how is the million fifty? you said million 50,000? Yeah. Uh, How is that broken up? Yeah, so uh, I've got about uh, 440000 uh in some retirement accounts that I'm kind of managing uh, with at my work. Uh, and then my wife's got another 96000 in her retirement at her work. So about half of it is in, you know, 401k IRAs, Roth IRAs, that kind of stuff. And I could go by each, break it down by each account if you want to get that granular. And then uh, the other half uh, is pretty much investment real estate with a few other, other exceptions. I only have about a hundred thousand in my personal home net worth or uh, equity of my home, excuse me. Uh, so most, all of that is, is actually physical real estate, uh, rental properties or, um, you know, trade, tradable assets in, in IRAs. Although there is a fair amount in, in, uh, now this year I've got the most I've ever had in, uh, like crypto assets. So I, I probably have 150 to 200 that, that swings pretty wildly on a day-to-day basis, um, in, in crypto assets, but some of that is in the IRAs. Uh, it's not all separate in trading uh, account. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So the the money that's in your let's just call it market investments between your retirement accounts and everything else. How long have you been building that, and have you been maxing it out over the last however many years? Yeah. So my journey uh, really got started. Uh, I started getting like serious with investing around 2013, uh, 14, somewhere around there. 
uh, they, I, I had my first account probably in 07, but I, I didn't know anything about it at all. My brother was an IT guy for a bank and I had some, I did a construction job and had some extra money. And so I put like five grand in to whatever the guy at the bank told me to and didn't think about it again for years. Right. And so then somewhere around 2014, I decided I probably wasn't going to do 20 years in the Marine Corps. And back then they had a all or nothing retirement plan, right? A pension. So if you got out early, you walked away with nothing. So when I realized that, I decided if I'm going to leave, uh, I probably should figure out how to replace this retirement I'm throwing away, right? And so that's when I started driving it into work. I would listen to one of the first books on Audible I listened to was uh, uh, The Intelligent Investor um, by uh, uh, Benjamin Graham and started listening to shows, you know, kind of like yourself, other shows. I don't think I listened to your show that early, but um, started reading books and listening to stuff on investing. And so I saved up for my first account somewhere around that time. I, I remember they, the USAA had an a, account feature where they would manage your account with some sort of advisor thing once you hit $25,000. So I remember like I didn't have enough for that and I had to save up for that. Make a, It was like a year goal or something. So that was about that time when those accounts really got started, right? You picture about 2014, 2013-ish. Um, and then I, you know, uh, started taking it pretty seriously. So we, we grew from that point, I would say at that point when me and my wife got married in 2010. So in around 2012 or so prior to getting serious with this, we probably had a net worth of a hundred, 150,000. And, uh, basically in the, in a decade, um, we've, you know, grown it, uh, to by almost a million. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Is that surprising to you that it, kind of happen that quickly? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice because, you know, they say like from the, some of those studies that I've read, the average millionaire, you know, makes about $77,000 a year. And they, they tend to hit that mark in like 29, 30 years. So, so it's nice to, to beat that, but I don't know that it, it's super surprising. Uh, cause I've been just so involved in it. So serious. I mean, I, I, I had a 45 minute commute in back in 2010 through 2016 to when I was working in the Marine Corps. And so I would drive 45 minutes in listening to a financial podcast and or audible book about it. And then 45 minutes home every day. So I'd have an hour and a half. And then when I'm working around the yard. So, I mean, I, I would probably do 20, 30 hours a week of reading other people's and great investors stories. And so you hear how so many other people have been successful. So I don't think it really surprised me after a couple of years of just immersing myself in reading about it. Um, you know, there's a little bit of doubt. Can I do it? They all can do it. Uh, but then you start, you start making some small bets and you start, uh, gaining confidence is like, Oh yeah, I, I can do this. Uh, you know, I remember I, I bought some Ford shares and like $12 a share or something. And, I was convinced they were going to go to like $24 a share. And so for the next three and a half, four years, it just went down and I stopped buying about $8 a share. I was like, maybe I am an idiot. Maybe I missed this. You know, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I still had enough hope in myself that I had looked at them, understood the business well enough. So it went all the way down to like $3 a share and I didn't buy any more, but I, I didn't sell. I stopped at like eight. And eventually, you know, five years later, I sold half of my shares at $24, $25 a share, you know? And so that was one of the first, and I did that with some other companies, but one of the first, like it took five year cycle. So you have to really have, believe in the books you're reading and believe that you can make it happen. But if you, if you have patience, you know, it, it does work. And it was a small amount of money. So you look back and say, man, I should have done it with more, but you, you're learning. So you, you start with what you can feel comfortable, you know? How old were you when you kind of started this journey on on directing yourself towards these investments? Yeah, so I, I would have been uh, I would have been like twenty six ish. You know? Okay, so you're pretty young. I mean, most people probably don't really get rock and roll until their thirties, if, if not forties. And I mean, heck, we've even had a few that were even on their fifties that didn't start. So starting in your twenties, mid twenties, I mean. Was it really just these books that were like, hey, let's do this, a little trial and error? You know, why not 
go a different route? Like, why did you choose the route that you chose? Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was an emotional thing in that, uh, at that point I was about probably year seven in the Marine Corps uh, and I decided I was, I was not going to stick around. So I knew I had a couple more years and I looked ahead and said, okay, I'm going to be 29 when I get out. And I had dropped out of college, two years in college to join the Marine Corps. So I'm going to be a, uh, a high school graduate uh, at 29, married um, with, uh, I was, I was in, you know, the combat MOSs. So no transferable skill, like, oh yeah, I could shoot somebody at a thousand yards, but how, how does that help? Right. So I'm going to be like, so it was this kind of moment of like a little bit of fear. Like I'm going to go back into the job workplace and be like, yeah, I worked for my family, dropped out of college, joined the Marine Corps and did that for nine years and have I'm starting over, right? Yeah. Almost 30. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, and I, I had enough confidence to believe that I could get out and go do something else. And it, and I felt like it was time for myself to do that, to be happy and family. I didn't want to just stay because of the financial security. But I was at, I was also like emotionally prodded into action. Like, you've got to learn something and figure out and become competent at something else because you're going to walk away from this. And I wanted to move home. So I didn't want to get into real estate or something in the local area where I was at in North Carolina at the time, because I wanted to move back to Alaska. And so investing in the public markets just seemed really accessible um, and transferable. Uh, so that's, that's part really, I guess, what draw, and it was, you could start with a small amount, you know, buying real estate or something, unless you really get into it and learn how to do some deal making at first, you need to come up with a down payment or, or you think you do anyways. Um, so it seemed more accessible. Uh, and I was studying it and playing around with it. And we went to this guy to have him do our taxes. And I kept asking him questions, asking him questions. And he turned around behind me, pulled the series 65, uh, uh, book off the shelf and said, well, if you're so interested in this, read this. And so he gave me the test study book to become a licensed, uh, advisor. And I thought, at the time that I was just reading it for my own knowledge. I never had any idea that I would work in this profession, but I read through the whatever 300 page book. And I thought, this isn't that hard. I, I understand this stuff. Um, and that was, that was like 2015, I think when I, or 14, maybe when I read through that book and, uh, probably 15 and it just, it just didn't, you know, sometimes you stumble into something that you have a little bit of a natural gift to, uh, and that's kind of what happened there, I guess, you know, it, it was, it's not like college when I w had to beat my head against a rock trying to study calculus and, you know, uh, that I had to work really, really hard to understand that stuff. Uh, some of this other, you know, valuing a business the same way you'd val a value when you go look at a, a private business or a public business, or you go look at a duplex you want to buy, it's the same thing. Is this a quality investment? What's it going to return on me? What's its cost? What's the market assessment? You know, what are there good managers? You can look at that stuff. So it appealed to me. It made sense. And I think part of that maybe is because I, even though I bounced around the world, uh, my dad, before he went into the mission field, he used to run a uh, construction company. So he, his friends and him, and they would talk about buildings and business. And so I grew up hearing some of this conversation and so I think it just kind of made sense. Like, how do you value a business? What, well, what's the equipment worth? What does it produce? What's the income, the losses, you know? And I enjoy it. I like talking to people. So um, I like, I like uh, talking about investments with people. That's why I'm on this podcast. I mean, this stuff's, it's fascinating to me. I, I, I enjoy the interactions, but it's not just the, the numbers and the analysis. It's, it's how it, people interact with it. You know, personal finance if, if this, if investing was just about numbers, AI and computers would do it. Right. And, but it's actually, there's human elements to it. And, and that's, what's fun too. I don't when know. I kind of went first, out of a hole there. No, that was awesome. When, when you first joined the Marine Corps and thank you for your service, by the way, how long did you plan on doing? Did you think you were going to make a career out of it and stay for, for much longer? Or, you know, we have a lot of people that come on this podcast in the, in the military and typically like, they enter the military thinking that'll be their career. And then, you know, it's 15 years down the road, 20 or whatever, where then they're thinking about that second, you know, kind of career, civilian career or whatever. But I'm just curious from your standpoint, since you did join so early, 
what kind of your mindset was, you know, when you're making that decision at say 20 years old? Yeah. So I joined, uh, you know, during an active war time, uh, and I, they wouldn't give me a contract for, for the special operations for recon. So I had, I joined infantry. They said, you can try out when you get there and I was successful. So I made it into recon right in the beginning. So I was with second reconnaissance battalion. Um, and then after four years of that, I went to MARSOC Marine special operations and pursued that. So I joined knowing I wanted to get into special operations right from the beginning. So in my mind, I had like two thoughts. Like uh, when I put aside any thought of failure, my thought was, look, I'm going into a high risk thing during a wartime. So I'm probably going to get killed at some point. Or if I get lucky and I live through it, you know, I'll just keep climbing this ladder as far as I can. Um, And so I thought I would do 20 years if I lived or whatever and just keep going into the those those circles. But, you know, things happen and life happens and the wars change and all this. And and so uh, at some point I got a little disillusioned and I said, OK, I'm done. Uh, and I and that was part of that whole I mentioned that fear of starting over. Well, me and my wife had said we're not going to have kids because you're in a high risk environment of combat deploying. And I don't want to be a widow and raise these kids and you're gone all the time. So I was like, well, I'm going to get out and be a 29 year old college dropout with no transferable skills. And we're going to have kids because that excuse is gone. Right. So, so I had this whole like adulting moment, you know, um, that really, uh, yeah. So I think when I initially went in, yeah, I thought a good chance to do 20 years, but at some point that changed. And, uh, uh, yeah. Did you worry about losing? And I don't know, is your pen, do you have a pension set up at all? Is it just part half or do you really have to, I don't, I'm not as familiar. Do you have to stay in for 20 so years to get anything? It's changed over time. Now, my understanding is it's, and, and it was happening as I was getting out basically, but they, now it's like a 401k kind of, you put in a, TF, a matching amount. And so you can take it with you when you leave. So it's more like the other government agencies. But at the time I was in the military, uh, was 20 or nothing, or sometimes they'd offer like, Hey, we really want you to retire early. So we'll let you out at 18 years and you can take, you know, 90% of your benefits. But if they didn't offer that and you just decided, Hey, I'm getting out at, 10 or 15 or nine years back then sucks to be you. I mean, it was an all or nothing thing. Um, so it's not that way anymore, but it was, you stay in until we tell a 20 year retirement or we offer you an early retirement. Otherwise, if you leave early, you, you just donated that to somebody else, you know? Um, so at the time I got out, uh, yeah, it was, it was an all or nothing. So I got, I had no pension system whatsoever. So when I got out, it was just, what have I put into my IRA? You know, um, that was basically what I had to, to start with that, you know? Yeah. So let's talk about your kind of investment strategy. Now you've just hit a million. You're, you're still young. Where do the kind of dollars get allocated from here? And do you have any plans to change any of that? Yeah. Um, I would say my investments are always, uh, evolving a little bit. I mean, I'm more willing to take risk now than I was five years ago because I have more of a proven track record with myself. Um, both my tolerances for you know wandering through a bad investment and letting it recover and cutting losses and or track record of making good investments. And when you have larger amounts, I, mean, I think this is part of why people say, you know, the, the first million is the hardest, the next one's not it's easier to take bigger swings because, you know, if you lose a hundred thousand and you have 200,000, that's traumatic. Right. But if you lose a hundred thousand and you have a million, it's, it's not fun, but it's not the end of the, it's not the same. It's not the same risk. Right. So, so when I six, seven years ago, you know, I might put three, 4,000 and most on a one investment that I was, you know, picking myself and like, if I'm going to pick a stock and I put most of it, 90% of it in passive indexes, right? Cause I didn't fully trust myself. So I put a small percentage towards things I would pick myself. Well, that's different now after doing this for 10 years, I'm much more willing to, you know, I, I, I put $35,000 a couple of years ago into, into Coinbase, you know, um, uh, a very risky publicly traded, you know, uh, crypto stock exchange. Right. Um, so 
yeah, my appetite for risk has grown with my track record and my resources. You know, in the future, I don't, I don't see it happening anytime soon, but at some point, maybe I'd like to get into uh, uh, syndicate real estate investing or something like that. I'd like to maybe get into commercial real estate investing. I've never done that. Um, work with some partners. So there are other areas I'd certainly want to branch out. I'd like to look into a little bit more international uh, exchanges, not just buying them through ADRs that are accessible, but actually being able to invest in other markets directly. Uh, but that's, I'm not quite ready for that stage yet. Um, but definitely, I think you should always be evolving and asking yourself what's next and um, are there other benefits either for diversification or some other reason why I should uh, look at some other investing. Do you have a target net worth at all? Yeah. Um, I think uh, I'd like to get to at least 5 million. I feel like at the three to 5 million, uh, preferably five at that point, unless things just go really well, I might want to adjust and um, focus on other things. I mean, and, like wealth is relative to everybody, uh, but for my wants and needs, it, when I hit that point, my standard of living could be as good as I really care to have it for the rest of my life. So then I might say, well, maybe I should spend the rest of my time doing uh, volunteer work, or maybe I should start giving away more money or something. Um, it's not to say that if the markets went really well and I found some good investments that I wouldn't change that at times. But um, I think one of the things we have to fight in life is, is the concept that we always need more. It's, it's always just a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, and, and that can be healthy because drive you to success and you can reach goals you didn't think were possible 10 years ago. But, uh, the most finite resource in this world is not money, it's time. And so when you're always going a little bit more, you're, there's something else that you could be doing with your time, right? So, yeah. You should know what that is. That's the best kind of notification. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. And the moment another business dream reality comes true. Shopify is the e-commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. In fact, I use it for several businesses that I have and my wife has. We love Shopify. Shopify simplifies selling online anything you can focus successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from in-person POS system to all-in-one e-commerce and it even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Hacked with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you the comfort of your business and your brand without having to learn new skills or design new code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is, is there to help you have success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash unveiled lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash unveiled to take your business to the next level. Once again, that's shopify.com slash unveiled. And thanks again to Shopify for sponsoring today's episode. Do you think that $5 million mark provides you enough to live in and live on in perpetuity? Yes. Would you actually mentally, do you think you'd be able to walk away from work or want to walk away from work when you hit that? No, probably not. Um, it's not healthy for people to to not be productive. And my boss here has been working in the financial industry, helping people retire for years. And he commonly tells people, you shouldn't retire from something, you should retire to something. Uh, you just need something productive. However, um, and maybe maybe your job and accumulating money and doing whatever you're doing is, is the most productive use of your time. But if that's the case, um, you still don't necessarily have to. Sometimes it's hard for people to move from an accumulating asset point to a deaccumulation. And and what's the point of dying and leaving fifty million to your kids? Like I want to leave my kids well set up, but I don't I don't want to leave them everything, right? It, it was, you you want to leave your kids enough money that they feel they can do anything in the world, but not enough that they don't have to do anything. And so, I think if I at that point I need to give more to causes I care about. If I, whatever the case is, I might still be working and bringing in revenue, but I need to start making sure that that's going out 
there's not there's not a lot of need in my mind for me personally to go up beyond that. You, you know, if you if you live in Fairbanks, Alaska, you can't spend much more than that. <laughs> I mean, I know guys here that are worth many, many times more than that, but they hide it from their neighbors. Like, you know, they drive the same trucks that I drive. They wear the same clothes. They live in the same neighborhoods. Like, this isn't it, Manhattan. <laughs> it, well, yeah. And I, I mean, I, it's, it's funny you bring that up because I've been seeing that more and more, I feel like, in some some of the circles I'm in where it's like there, there comes a, a point where like utility of your money like starts to decrease almost where you can't buy anything more. You can't pay for anything more that really adds a lot of value to your life other than going and buying more expensive assets, whether it's like, Hey, okay, I'll buy a $3 million home instead of a $1 million home, or I'm going to buy that business, which then generates more income or buy such bigger assets that yep. generate more income or create more issues in your life, depending on what, how you look at it. Right. You're or what so you have, right. you know, like there comes a point where that stops in a way, you know, I mean, you could go spend a few, there's cars out there that are a couple million dollars or there's some that are several hundred thousand dollars more than, you know, just driving your average Ford truck or whatever. But like the utility starts to decrease at some point. You can, you can't go and spend time at five houses all at once. Right. Well, like, I, I know a guy who's got a warehouse full of those cars, but he doesn't want people to know that he has a warehouse full of those cars. <laughs> he drives one of them around at a time. And, you know, yeah. And you're absolutely right. And for a lot of those people, you know, it's the game of being successful that keeps driving them to buy the next building, buy the next real estate. Cause you're right. They don't need it. And, but to them, it's just, it's a sign of being successful and that's fine to a certain extent. Uh, but it's a trap. You got to be careful when you're getting your validation, your need from always building the biggest business and becoming more successful than your neighbor. And I mean, it's good. It drives us to be productive, but um, you know, may, maybe spending time with your kids is more important at some point. The, one of the most uh, influential books in my life uh, is The Millionaire Next Door, an older book written, written in the 90s. But he tells us one of the stories in there uh, from an interview, uh, a millionaire he interviewed. He talks about how uh, this guy had helped a bunch of other people start businesses and they all became successful. So later on in his life, they all pulled together and they bought him a Rolls Royce. It's a pretty nice gift, right, to receive. He gave them the keys back and said he didn't want it. They were shocked. And he said, thanks, I appreciate the idea. It's really awesome. But he had a blue collar business in a rough part of town that he ran. He said, I can't drive this to work after work because uh, then my employees are going to think I'm taking advantage of them. It might get stolen. It's going to create all these hassles. I, After work, I like to stop off at the lake and fish. I can't throw fish in the back of the Rolls Royce like I can my old beater sedan. I'm not going to park this Rolls Royce in my blue collar neighborhood house that I live in. So he said the car wasn't worth changing his life. And I really think that 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 becomes true and uh, for a lot of people or I feel like I want to remember that. Right. So I I don't allow I allow money to be a tool that I use, but it doesn't begin to possess me. That's my goal. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's uh, let's wrap up with some rapid fire questions. What's the uh, most expensive pair of pants or shoes that you've purchased? I think I bought my wife a three hundred dollar by the time shipping was included pair of like winter muckluck boots from Stoger. So those are probably the most expensive shoes I've ever purchased. Uh, I don't know the most expensive pants. I have probably 70 bucks or something. Jeans are expensive nowadays. But I remember the first pair of new pants I ever bought. Sam's Club's member marks for 11 bucks. Uh, bought that with my own money when I was working a job at 14. Uh, and that is, it made an impression on me. Um, so I don't usually try and spend uh, much more than that if I can. Okay. What about the most expensive meal out? There's not much in Fairbanks that's super expensive. Expensive, uh, you know, you probably go out for two people for 70, 80 bucks. Uh, I, I don't know if I really ever cracked a hundred. I don't, I don't go, I'm not a fancy restaurant kind of guy. No, no expensive fish or seafood or anything up there. I mean, I, you, you might be able to, I don't know. They, I like prime rib. There's a nice tur the turtle club steakhouse. You get a nice, uh, prime rib and it, it's, you know, like 30, 40 bucks or something a person. And, uh, it is, 
awesome. But where I where I where we spurge and waste money, uh, my wife likes horses, so we have horses which are expensive in Alaska. You can keep them pretty cheap down in in uh, North Carolina, but they're expensive up here. And I like guns. I probably have you know uh, twenty grand or more. I uh, in in guns that I've bought, so so I, I I buy new toys every now and again um, and waste some money there. So it's not like I don't waste money. Uh, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about the most expensive uh, trip or vacation or experience? Yeah, we spent uh, probably two grand, maybe maybe. Yeah, about two grand. We went to Hawaii. I most of it I had racked up enough reward points on the credit cards, so we that booked the complete hotel and the rental car. So we just had to pay for incidentals and stuff. So it's probably like two grand, four or five years to Hawaii. But we're planning a trip to Italy, and it sounds like it's going to cost me about ten grand, which is going to be pretty huge. I've never done that before. So so that's uh, that's probably going to happen this next year. So I guess we can count that. Okay. What about uh, the most expensive um, car or maybe it is your guns that or truck up there? I don't know. <laughs> My wife's truck's the most expensive. We probably have 25 into that thing. It, it was worth for like 36, but I bought a truck for 14 in an auction and then traded it in with the dealer and made some swaps. So we ended up probably making 10 grand or so off that deal. So she's got a 30 plus grand truck, uh, uh, but probably mid mid twenties on what we paid for it. That's the most expensive truck I've, I've gotten. We're, we're maybe going to top that though. Yeah. I was going to, I was laughing at myself telling my wife, you might be a, a redneck if your most expensive thing you vehicle you've ever bought is a tractor. She was down there looking at $40,000 tractors the other day and she's half tempted to buy one this summer. So We'll see if that happens. Okay. Uh, what was your first job? I shoveled manure out of uh, Edie's, uh, uh, it was a uh, Flat Mountain Ranch. She had a bunch of horses that she trained and boarded. And uh, I was a teenager, 13, 14. And uh, that's what I did all summer and all winter. Uh, I think I was getting under the table, like five bucks an hour or something. Uh, minimum wage was like seven, maybe back then or six fifty. Um, but it was a good job. I, I could turn my mind off and just shovel. <laughs> and you made how much for that? I think it was like five bucks an hour. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. Uh, what's the dumbest thing you've ever wasted money on? Uh, probably some bank stock that the uh, the Fed shut down. I've, I've had two banks that the government has killed uh, and I've lost all my money each time. One, one of the banks my brother worked for and in the 2008 crisis, they shut it down, made a bigger bank buy it out. Uh, that's, that's, and then, the, then they had another one here this last year uh, that they shut down. So I'm, I, I'm not a fan of the, of the regulatory agencies. Uh, <laughs> watchful eye on the banking industry. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's something you spent way too much money on, but you don't regret? Probably, probably the, the horses and the guns. Uh, we spent a lot of money on those toys, but, but their, their lifestyle. I mean, to some extent, what's, what's money for? You've got to have some, some enjoyment, right? Or maybe, maybe a better answer would be my kids. They cost 25 or 30 each for the, 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 the uh, hospital bills, but, but they were awesome. Uh, they are awesome. Okay. Um, what's a closely held belief that you once had that you recently changed your mind on? I used to, I used to enjoy the idea of being country and blue collar and didn't want anything to do with money. I didn't want to be rich because that was for people that like to drive fancy luxury cars and were snooty. And then I realized money is just time and creatively the creativity stored in IOUs. So it's just freedom. I did, the financial freedom was probably one of the biggest shifts in how I looked at money. Uh, I, I honestly did not want when I was a kid, I was not interested in, and my brother always was, and I just didn't care about those conversations. That change happened slowly, but, uh, uh, that was the biggest change I think probably for my financial picture. Is your brother a millionaire? Yes. More so than me, uh, but he's a risk taker and he always has been. 
uh, and uh, and he didn't run off to join the military. He's, he was he's been in business ever since. He's a couple of years older than me, and he's he's probably ten times where I'm at. But he's got leverage. I don't have leverage. I I got no debt basically. Uh, well, a little bit. I've got a little more on my house and one rental property, but. Um, but he's a risk taker, but he's done really, really well. And I am not envious of the risk he takes or his rewards, uh, but I'm happy for him. That's awesome. What's a key lesson you learned from childhood? I, I think uh, to be genuine and honest, people remember people who are de duplicitous. Um, I think if you carry good values, uh, people will want to help you. People will want to work with you. Uh, people will look out for you. Um, I've had people warn me of bad deals. I've had, yeah, I, I think uh, integrity will get you far in life. What's the most fun that you've had with money? Most fun that I've had with money. I, I like that I have the option to do things. Uh, my sister was short a few grand for some property so I could write her a check. My brother, uh, needed a loan to buy a house. So I gave him a loan. Um, I, it's nice to be in a position where you can help people, um, rather than I'll pray for you. You know, <laughs> I hope that works out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 10 K what store are you spending it at? If I was going to spend on like consumer 10 K, yep. uh, well, if I, I'd probably try and go to a, uh, uh, a Bass Pro Shop or a Cabela's, but there isn't any of them around here, so I'd have to travel. Uh, but there's a Sportsman's Warehouse here that's pretty similar. Um, yeah. You Brian, I know you're buying a few guns and a new safe. Sounds like. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, well, you got some bears up there. You probably need a few, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I'll get a bear this summer. I, I need to go out and get in the woods a little bit more. Uh, they didn't come to my to the last spot I was looking for them, but maybe next yeah. time. Well, you put enough food out, they'll get they'll get right in your backyard, right? <laughs> right, that's the idea. Yeah. What's the craziest thing you've ever done to earn money? Craziest thing I've ever done to earn money. I before I joined the Marine Corps, uh, I was working on the North Slope of Alaska, so uh, up on the coast up there, uh, Dead Horse Prudhoe Bay, the oil camps, and we were building a man camp for oil workers, uh, and we had to get this thing finished. And so we were working a hundred uh, hours a week, hundred plus hours a week. And I was 19, 20 and dumb. So I had to, I tied myself off by myself working on a roof and had to like climb down the side of this building uh, to nail some stuff on. So I tied my feet and went over head first and climbed down this, this building on the side, nailing stuff in and then had to shimmy back up. Um, and I almost didn't make it back up and thought I was going to pass out. And I thought I'm literally hanging outside this building at whatever it was, 15 below in the middle of a night by myself. Cause the other workers are working somewhere else. And I thought I'm an idiot. Uh, but I, I guess that's why, uh, uh, wars are fought by young men because we're all just testosterone and do things without thinking. But we got the building built. Wow, what a story. Uh, what habit has changed the most since you became a millionaire? Or has there one newly minted? Yeah, I don't know that it's been long enough to say that any habits have changed since I've become. I, I think the biggest thing is mentally just at, as I've the last couple of years hit 800 and 900 getting closer to this number uh, is just that a growing confidence like this is going to happen this is working you're going to hit the next goals so starting to think about you know sort of pacing yourself and and enjoying the moment i think sometimes uh people that are really goal oriented can put aside everything and save every dollar and save in 20 30% of your income until you hit there and then you're 15 years down the road and you didn't enjoy any of that time, you know? So learning to say, I still want to grow, but how do I have some balance to that? So that way I can enjoy the moment. So trying to still grow, but take time off from work and spend it with the family, go camping and, and uh, being able to spend a little bit like this, this trip to Italy, 
five years ago, three years ago, I would have laughed at the idea of spending 10 grand, you know? Um, and the same thing is true with using professional services, like paying for tax planning and lawyers. Uh, I would not, just expending a few thousand dollars for those services uh, would have seemed ridiculous to me before. Um, but over time, you start to see the value of it. And so you're more willing to part with your your money, I think. Any last pieces of advice for somebody who's just starting out on their journey? I think uh, you want to have the majority, 80% or something, uh, in to something safe and passive. But don't be afraid to take a little bit bigger swings. Um, if you're not uh, a natural you know, financial risk taker, just, just try. Think of what a friend of mine told me once, uh, you pay money to go to a college class. So if it, if it doesn't work out and your investment doesn't go well, you can think of that as you paid tuition to learn something. So just take some of that money and start doing something with it. Try it out and stick with it for, for a few years. Don't just drop it, uh, but look at it as your pain to learn and that will pay off big dividends in the future. But, you, you know, keep keep the bulk of it. But I wish I'd been a little more aggressive a little earlier on. Awesome. That's Josh, the net worth of $1,050,000, newly minted millionaire. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, I appreciate it. This is fun. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.